Be sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk and reality shows and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network? Welcome to Wisdom Through Action. I'm your host, Kay Smith. In the fourth way, we study man in connection with his place in the world, since it is the only way to know what is possible for us in terms of development and what is not possible. Today we are going to explore further man's immortality and his place in the universe. Here is a 20 minute video that we've created to explore these ideas further. Our fundamental idea shall be that man as we know him is not a completed being, that nature develops him only up to a certain point and then leaves him to develop further by his own efforts and devices or to live and die such as he was born, or to degenerate and lose capacity for development. Evolution of man in this case will mean the development of certain inner qualities and features which usually remain undeveloped and cannot develop by themselves. P. D. Uspensky While studying with Gurdjieff and confronted by ideas such as this, Uspensky said, for a man of Western culture, it is of course difficult to believe and to accept the idea that an ignorant fakir, a naive monk, or a yogi who has retired from life may be on the way to evolution, while an educated European, armed with exact knowledge and all the latest methods of investigation, has no chance whatever and is moving in a circle from which there is no escape. Yes. That is because people believe in progress and culture, said G. There is no progress whatever. Everything is just the same as it was thousands and tens of thousands of years ago. The outward form changes. The essence does not change. Man remains just the same. Civilized and cultured people live with exactly the same interests as the most ignorant savages. Modern civilization is based on violence and slavery and fine words. But all these fine words about progress and civilization are merely words. People are machines. Machines have to be blind and unconscious. They cannot be otherwise. And all their actions have to correspond to their nature. Everything happens. No one does anything progress and civilization, in the real meaning of these words, can appear only as the result of conscious efforts. They cannot appear as the result of unconscious mechanical actions. And what conscious effort can there be in machines? And if one machine is unconscious, then a hundred machines are unconscious, and so are a thousand machines, or a hundred thousand, or a million and the unconscious activity of a million machines must necessarily result in destruction and extermination. It is precisely in unconscious involuntary manifestations that all evil lies. A normal being wishes to live forever. No one wishes to die. A normal man is one who not only has actualized his inherited potentialities, but has freed himself from his subjectivity. We are made in the image of God, and God's attribute is immortality. If God wishes to live, he has shared that wish with all of us. He has also provided the means by which that wish to live may exist forever. This wish to live constitutes a being. Once being alive, there is no choice. We must live forever. 
The representative of God in any individual is that which tells him how or what God would do in any situation. Your powers are to actualize, to be aware of your presence. This is your money in the bank, your cash, your earning ability. Next to awareness, the most important thing is time. The flow of time through us gives us our chance to extract what we can. Time is a threefold stream passing through our three centers. We fish in this stream. What we catch is ours. What we don't is gone. Time does not wait for us to catch all in the stream. If we catch enough, we have enough to create the three higher bodies and become enduring. Time is the sum of our potential experience, the totality of our possible experiences. We live our experiences successively. This is the first dimension of time. To be able to live experiences simultaneously is adding another or second dimension to time. To be aware of this simultaneity is called solid time or the third dimension of time. When we have identified ourselves with time, it will be as Revelation says, and there shall be time no longer. I beg you, before starting on this journey to question yourself, you are plunging into the dark. Here is a little lamp. I show you how to rub it, but make sure you know how to rub it. Can it be said that man possesses immortality, life after death? Immortality is one of the qualities we ascribe to people without having a sufficient understanding of their meaning. Other qualities of this kind are individuality, in the sense of an inner unity, a permanent and unchangeable I, consciousness, and will. All these quantities can belong to a man, but this certainly does not mean that they do belong to him or belong to each and every man. In order to understand what man is at the present time, that is, at the present level of development, it is necessary to understand to a certain extent what he can be, that is, what he can attain. Only by understanding the correct sequence of development possible will people cease to ascribe to themselves what, at present, they do not possess, and what, perhaps, they can only acquire after great effort and great labor. According to an ancient teaching, traces of which may be found in many systems, old and new, a man who has attained the full development possible for man a man, in the full sense of the word, consists of four bodies. These four bodies are composed of substances which gradually become finer and finer, mutually interpenetrate one another, and form four independent organisms standing in a definite relationship to one another, but capable of independent action. The reason why it is possible for four bodies to exist is that the human organism, that is, the physical body, has such a complex organization that, under certain conditions, a new independent organism can grow in it, affording a much more convenient and responsive instrument for the activity of consciousness than the physical body. The consciousness manifested in this new body is capable of governing it, and it has full power and full control over the physical body. In this second body, under certain conditions, a third body can grow, again having characteristics of its own. The consciousness manifested in this third body has full power and control over the first two bodies. And the third body possesses the possibility of acquiring knowledge inaccessible either to the first or to the second body. In the third body, under certain conditions, a fourth can grow, 
which differs as much from the third as the third differs from the second and the second from the first. The consciousness manifested in the fourth body has full control over the first three bodies and itself. These four bodies are defined in different teachings in various ways. The first is the physical body, in Christian terminology, the carnal body. The second, in Christian terminology, is the natural body. The third is the spiritual body. And fourth, in the terminology of esoteric Christianity, is the divine body. In theosophical terminology, the first is the physical body, the second is the astral, the third is the mental, and the fourth the causal. As we have shown, in the terminology of certain Eastern teachings, the first body is the carriage, physical body, the second body is the horse, feelings, desires, the third the driver, mind, and the fourth the master, I consciousness will. Such comparisons and parallels may be found in most systems and teachings which recognize something more in man than the physical body. But almost all these teachings, while repeating in a more or less familiar form the definitions and divisions of the ancient teaching, have forgotten or omitted its most important feature, which is that man is not born with the finer bodies, and that they can only be artificially cultivated in him, provided favorable conditions both internal and external are present. The astral body is not an indispensable implement for man. It is a great luxury which only a few can afford. A man can live quite well without an astral body. His physical body possesses all the functions necessary for life. It is obtained by means of fusion, that is, by means of terribly hard inner work and struggle. Man is not born with it. A man without astral body may even produce the impression of being a very intellectual or even spiritual man, and may deceive not only others, but also himself. This applies still more, of course, to the mental body and the fourth body. Ordinary man does not possess these bodies or their corresponding functions, but he often thinks and makes others think that he does. The reasons for this are, first, the fact that the physical body works with the same substances of which the higher bodies are composed, only these substances are not crystallized in him, do not belong to him, and secondly, it has all the functions analogous to those of the higher bodies, though, of course, they differ from them considerably. The chief difference between the functions of a man possessing the physical body only and the functions of the four bodies is that, in the first case, the functions of the physical body govern all the other functions. In other words, everything is governed by the body, which, in its turn, is governed by external influences. In the second case, the commander control emanates from the higher body. The functions of the physical body may be represented as parallel to the functions of the four bodies. This diagram represents the parallel functions of a man of physical body and a man of four bodies. In the first case, that is, in relation to the functions of a man of physical body only, the automaton depends upon external influences and the next three functions depend upon the physical body and the external influences it receives. Desires or aversions, I want, I don't want, I like. I don't like. That is, functions occupying the place of the second body depend upon accidental shocks and influences. Thinking, which corresponds to the functions of the third body, is an entirely mechanical process. Will is absent in ordinary mechanical man. He has desires only. And a greater or lesser permanence of desires and wishes is called a strong or a weak will. 
In the second case, that is, in relation to the functions of the four bodies, the automatism of the physical body depends upon the influences of the other bodies, Instead of the discordant and often contradictory activity of different desires, there is one single I, whole, indivisible, and permanent. There is individuality, dominating the physical body and its desires, and able to overcome both its reluctance and its resistance. Instead of the mechanical process of thinking, there is consciousness, and there is will, that is, a power not merely composed of various, often contradictory desires belonging to different eyes, but issuing from consciousness and governed by individuality or a single and permanent I. Only such a will can be called free, for it is independent of accident and cannot be altered or directed from without. An Eastern teaching describes the functions of the four bodies, their gradual growth, and the conditions of this growth in the following way. Let us imagine a vessel or a retort filled with various metallic powders. The powders are not in any way connected with each other, and every accidental change in the position of the retort changes the relative position of the powders. If the retort be shaken or tapped with the finger, then the powder which was at the top may appear at the bottom, or in the middle, while the one which was at the bottom may appear at the top. There is nothing permanent in the position of the powders, and under such conditions there can be nothing permanent. This is an exact picture of our psychic life. Each succeeding moment, new influences may change the position of the powder which is on the top, and put in its place another which is absolutely its opposite. Science calls this state of the powders the state of mechanical mixture. The essential characteristic of the interrelation of the powders to one another in this kind of mixture is the instability of these interrelations and their variability. It is impossible to stabilize the interrelation of powders in a state of mechanical mixture. But the powders may be fused. The nature of the powders makes this possible. To do this, a special kind of fire must be lighted under the retort which, by heating and melting the powders, finally fuses them together. Fused in this way, the powders will be in the state of a chemical compound, and now they can no longer be separated by those simple methods which separated and made them change places when they were in a state of mechanical mixture. The contents of the retort have become indivisible, individual. This is a picture of the formation of the second body. The fire, by means of which fusion is attained, is produced by friction, which in its turn is produced in man by the struggle between yes and no. If a man gives way to all his desires, or panders to them, there will be no inner struggle in him, no friction, no fire. But if, for the sake of attaining a definite aim, he struggles with desires that hinder him, he will then create a fire which will gradually transform his inner world into a single whole. Let us return to our example. The chemical compound obtained by fusion possesses certain qualities, a certain specific gravity, a certain electrical conductivity, and so on. These qualities constitute the characteristics of the substance in question. But by means of work upon it, of a certain kind, the number of these characteristics may be increased, that is, the alloy may be given new properties which did not primarily belong to it. It may be possible to magnetize it, to make it radioactive, and so on. The process of imparting new properties to the alloy corresponds to the process of the formation of the third body and of the acquisition of new knowledge and powers with the help of the third body. When the third body has been formed and has acquired all the properties, powers, and knowledge possible for it, there remains the problem of fixing this knowledge and these powers because, having been imparted to it by influences of a certain kind, they may be taken away by these same influences or by others. By means of a special kind of work for all three bodies, the acquired properties 
may be made the permanent and inalienable possession of the third body. The process of fixing these acquired properties corresponds to the process of the formation of the fourth body. And only the man who possesses four fully developed bodies can be called a man in the full sense of the word. This man possesses many properties which ordinary man does not possess. One of these properties is immortality. All religions and all ancient teachings contain the idea that by acquiring the fourth body man acquires immortality and they all contain indications of the ways to acquire the fourth body that is immortality. In this connection certain teachings compare man to a house of four rooms. Man lives in one room the smallest and poorest of all and until he is told of it he does not suspect the existence of the other rooms which are full of treasures. When he does learn of this, he begins to seek the keys of these rooms, and especially of the fourth, the most important room. And when a man has found his way into this room, he really becomes the master of his house, for only then does the house belong to him wholly and forever. The fourth room gives man immortality, and all religious teachings strive to show the way to it, there are a great many ways, some shorter and some longer, some harder and some easier, but all, without exception, lead or strive to lead in one direction, that is, to immortality. Again, immortality is not a property with which man is born, but man can acquire immortality. Earlier in one of our lectures, we said that we study man, and parallel with that, we study the universe in which he lives, in order to understand why a man is what he is. In some ways, man is analogous to the universe. The same laws operate in him, and we can understand some of the laws more easily by understanding, by studying man, and understand other laws by studying the universe. The first thing that we realize is the limitations of our perception and thinking power. So included in our study will be the study of our limitations. This system enlarges our knowledge to a great degree. As said before, the fourth way is a system of self-development that comes from higher mind. Higher mind does not have the limitations of our mind, so in that the system can guide us to bridge many gaps in our ability to perceive and think in other categories. Try to think of the world apart from yourself. Even with the help of the telescope or the microscope, we have to admit how limited our capacities of perception are. And our capacity for mental seeing is infinitely more limited. It is said that even if we were to come in contact with the source of full knowledge, such as we are, we would not be able to take it or use it because of the limitation of our mind. As we study these ideas, hopefully we will open up our minds to some new points of view. We can improve our instrument for inquiring knowledge. This is the idea of self-improvement. From the point of view of this system, only knowledge of the whole as regard is regarded as knowledge, because knowledge of the part is not knowledge, it is ignorance. And almost all our ordinary knowledge is merely knowledge of a small part without knowing the place of this part in the whole. Therefore, we cannot gain understanding of our place. There's a certain book of aphorisms that Gurdjieff introduced to his students which says, to know means to know all. To know a part of something means not to know. It is not difficult to know all because in order to know all, one has to know very little. But in order to know this little, one has to know pretty much. So we have to start with this pretty much, with this idea of coming to this very little, which is necessary for the knowledge of all. Knowledge of all is only possible with the use of two principles, the principle of relativity and the principle of scale. 
with the principle of scale, we study a man laying on the grass on one scale in detail, and we study the house in which he lives, and well, but not as well as we study the man. Then we study the neighborhood, the town, state, country, continent, earth, sun, and solar system. And lastly, the Milky Way, all from greater to lesser detail, depending on how relative the scale is to the man himself. We call this the principle, principle of relativity and scale. Now we need to re talk a little bit about the law of three. Remember we said everything in the world, all manifestations of energy, all kinds of action, both in the world and in human activity, whether internal or external, are always manifestations of three forces, active or first force, passive or second force, and neutralizing or third force. This is an esoteric truth that has been known secretly and portrayed in various symbols. All forces are actually active, but in different ways, for a force cannot be passive. This difference in their activity makes all the variety of phenomena that exist in the world. The three forces work together, but one of them predominates in each combination. When three forces meet, things happen. Now, in relation to man and the universe, it is important to remember that the fourth way is a complete system, and it has its own language. Matter must also have certain definite denominations, according to which force works through it, no matter whether it is organic, inorganic, a chemical compound, or a compound. When an active force passes through any kind of matter, it is called a carbon. When the passive force works through it, it is called oxygen. And when neutralizing force works through it, it is called nitrogen. And when all three forces work through it to make a manifestation, it is called a hydrogen. Take these names simply as labels. Thus the law of three brings relativity into our definition of matter. Instead of one iron, we have four irons. Instead of one copper, four coppers, and so on. Father, mother, son, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. The family is hydrogen. The beginning of the new family is the sun. In religious terms, the Holy Trinity. In our ordinary thinking, we only think of two forces, active and resistance, positive and negative electricity, and so on. That is because in our ordinary state of consciousness, we do not and cannot see three forces. We are third force blind. We do not fully observe even two forces and generally expect things to happen when only one force is present. We wish things would be different in our lives, but things cannot happen unless there are three forces manifesting. That is why we are so often disappointed. In the system, we learn about the law of three, and then we learn how to use the law of three in a practical way. We learn how to do. In our ordinary study of man's place in the world, we not only learn where man is and where, it can, where he can be, but more importantly, how he can get there. And this involves a working knowledge of the law of three. Triads, or combinations of the law of three, here we will speak of six activities that man can participate in according to which force and matter occupies which place. Triads refer to events, but a succession of events must follow another law, the law of seven. No force can ever work continuously in the same direction. It works for a time, then diminishes in intensity and either changes direction or undergoes an inner change. In every octave, or period of vibrations, and either double or half that number, there are two places where the vibrations undergo a change. Slow down, and then start again. If something does not give an added shock at these intervals, the octave changes directions. It is easiest to observe the law of seven in human active actions. You can see how when people begin to do something after some time, without any visible reason, their efforts diminish. Work slows down, 
And if some special effort is not made or some shock given, the octave deviates. And with time, there will be more and more deviations until it becomes its own opposite. Now, having all this in mind, we come to the study of the universe to determine what is man's place in the world. Man lives on the Earth, but the Earth is one of the planets in the solar system. So man belongs to the planetary world. The Earth occupies a certain place in the solar system. So we can say we also belong to the Sun. The Sun is one of the stars of the Milky Way. So in a sense, we belong to the Milky Way. Then we can say that the galaxy is one of the many galaxies that make up the world of galaxies. Then philosophically, we can conceive of a state of things where everything is one, like an apple is one. This is called the absolute. In work language, there is a diagram called the passage of forces, showing all worlds and how pa forces pass from one set of worlds to the next. In Christian terms, the ray of creation represents the hierarchy. In the New Testament, Chris, Christ says that the centurion, the soldier who approaches him to heal his son, who tells Christ that he knows the Christ only has to say the word and his son will be healed because the soldier understands hierarchy. He has faith because he knows there is a hierarchy, everything from star to grain of sand. Everything has a place in the ray of creation and each thing is alive. It is the hierarchy of being. In this diagram of the ray of creation, we see that the absolute is world one. The absolute only creates the world of the next order to itself, and the will of the absolute does not manifest itself beyond world three. The number of the world is also the number of laws in that world. The fewer the laws, the more rarefied, radiant, and finer the energy and being of that world. The greater the number of laws a world is under, the more restricted, dense, and coarser the energy and being of that world. We think the Absolute can do anything, yet there are things the Absolute cannot do because it begins by setting up the first order of laws and that puts in motion the next order of laws and so on. If the Absolute wanted to manifest their will on our level, they would have to destroy all the laws on all levels in the world, all levels in between, which would mean the destruction of the whole ray of creation. Taking the ray of creation as a succession of events, it can be regarded as an octave. It is a descending octave if we look at it from top to bottom, from the Absolute or all in one, to all the variations and multiplicity of forms that we know. On the other hand, taking the ray from the bottom to the top, it is an ascending octave. Everything in the universe, moon, earth, man, sun, galaxy, may be striving toward the next level of being and consciousness, which would indicate that there is also an upward flow back to the source, back to God, back to our home, seen in the sense of recreation or regeneration. Looking at the ray of creation as a succession of events, it can be seen as an octave. And remember, in any octave, there are two intervals which must be filled to have the octave continue straight without deviation. The first interval in the octave comes right after the absolute and is filled by the absolute. The second interval is between the planets and the Earth, and here a special appliance had to be cosmically created. It is organic life on Earth. Man is also part of organic life on Earth. Organic life, or nature, guarantees the transmission of energies that make the growth of the ray of creation possible. The growing point of the ray is the moon. The idea is that eventually the moon will become like the Earth and the earth like the sun, and so on. Organic life is a sort of receiving apparatus for catching and transmitting influences coming from the planets of the solar system. While alive, when organic life on earth dies, the magnetic body goes to the moon to feed the moon. 
Everything that lives serves the purposes of the earth, and everything that dies feeds the moon. If we realize that everything is alive and everything is connected, that if the absolute is one whole, like an apple, of course, every part of the apple is connected and interacts in some way with and for the whole. This is a hard law, the law that one class of living beings eats another class. This not only makes organic life self-supporting, but also enables it to feed the moon and serve as a transmitter of energies. Thus, organic life serves many purposes, those of greater worlds, the planets, the earth, and the moon. When I first heard of this law, I thought, oh, this cannot be. What of dying and going to heaven? Well, when I looked around me, I, I could see that man, while he is alive, eats meat, fish, and plants. He eliminates what is not digestible to him, which feeds another lower class of living beings. Anyone who has watched nature programs on television knows that life on earth is an eat or be eaten environment. And it is only because we no longer live in the wild that we do not think of it almost every moment. But in a way, even in civilized society, we know that there is some bigger whole manipulating and pulling this, our strings and that we need to know what that is and how it works. Now man is an incomplete being. Nature has brought him to a certain point in his development and left him there to develop further through his own will and effort. He is capable of developing to a point instead of being eaten by the moon, a lower world. He may develop his four higher bodies and be eaten instead by a higher world, the sun. We might see the moon as hell in old literature and the sun as heaven. All the worlds from the absolute to the moon are made up of manifestations of energies of a specific density of vibrations called hydrogens. Remember, a hydrogen is the resultant of the law of three. This next table shows all the hydrogens in the universe from the absolute to the moon. The foods man eats, the air he breathes, and the impressions he takes in now refines itself within him to certain energies. Energy to think with, to feel with, to move with, and to live with. But he is capable of using that food to a much higher degree through special training in a sea influence school. So by certain techniques, first of stopping the wasting of fine energy in such things as identification, the expression of negative emotions, imagination, and then by generating finer and finer energies by certain other special techniques, man may create first the astral body, then the mental body, and finally the divine body, higher being bodies that can withstand the death of the human machine and be immortal in relation to the solar system. Gurdjieff and Ospensky present us with the classification of all things living in this next diagram of everything living, which indicates that in nature, everything is connected and everything is alive. According to this diagram, every kind of creature, every degree of being is defined by what's, what serves as food for this kind of creature or being of a given level and for what they themselves serve as food. Because in the cosmic order, each class of creature feeds on a definite class of lower creature and is food for a definite class of higher creatures. Each square denotes a living being. The hydrogen in the lower circle shows what the class of the given creature eats or feeds on. The hydrogen in the upper circle shows the class which eats, feeds on these creatures. The hydrogen in the middle circle is the average hydrogen of this class, indicating what this creature is. Man's place is in the seventh square from the bottom, or the fifth from the top. According to this diagram, man is hydrogen 24. He feeds on hydrogen 96, and he is food for hydrogen 6. 
You can see on the diagram that the square one lower than man is vertebrates, and the one below that is invertebrates. Invertebrates are in hydrogen 96, so invertebrates are food for man. These are not the invertebrates that we know as such. This is a new language. Basically, in work terms, man is hydrogen 24, which means the real part of him is his essence. It is made of energy of the sun, carbon-12, combining with oxygen-48, the earth, producing a being somewhere in between nitrogen-24 and the whole family, hydrogen-24, man, essential man, astral body. Work on oneself begins with essence, world-24, with the development of hydrogen-12, higher emotional, comes the level of man number five. Then with the development of hydrogen six comes the development of higher mental center, man number six. Further work on refinement and crystallization, the divine body produces man number seven, who is immortal within the limits of the solar system, the master. In the video that we watched at the beginning of this show, we discussed the development of man from mechanical man, man one, two, and three, the horse, carriage, and driver, to the beginning of work on oneself, man number four, then the development of the higher emotional center, man number five, then higher intellectual center, man number six, and purification and crystallization, the divine body, man number seven. In this diagram of everything living, it shows that man, essence, world 24, eats world 96, or overcomes the limitations of his false personality and is eaten by world six, all sons. The next square shows that the higher emotional center, the self, or world 12, eats or overcomes the limitations of his personality, physical body, and is eaten by world three, all worlds. The next square shows higher intellectual, the mental body, world six, eats or overcomes the limitations of their essence, becomes immortal, does not have to be reborn into a human machine, and is eaten by higher school. The beatitude of eternal love becomes part of the body of the mystic Christ. Man is an image of the world. He was created by the same laws which created the whole of the world. By knowing and understanding himself, he will know and understand the whole world all the laws that create and govern the world. The microcosm of the individual embodies the same laws and dimensions as embodied within the macrocosm. The inner cosmos of consciousness thus corresponds to the structuring of world orders and dimensions within the larger universe. The hidden dimensions of the microcosm and the micro macrocosm allow for existence after death the many phenomena of psychic science, cosmic experiences, higher states of consciousness, and ultimately attaining real I and being a particle of the whole. This is from poems sacrificed by P.D. Ospensky. There is no death, but there is transfiguration, for only in transfiguration is possible complete truth-knowing which reunites the part with the whole, the creation with the creator, and imparts the beatitude of eternal love, the providence of the immortal soul for ages aeonian. If man, as part of organic life, fulfills a purpose in the scheme of the universe, what further purpose can he serve by gaining consciousness? That depends on what we want. You may be satisfied with certain purposes of nature, or you may have your own ideas. By becoming conscious, you may serve your own purpose, but if you are not conscious, you only serve the purposes of nature. Nature wants man to be as he is in this place. This is the reason why only a few can escape. They, they can escape because man is very small. See you next time here on Wisdom Through Action.